May I request those who are at the back to please occupy the front seats? Okay. All right. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. We're happy to see you today for the PIDS SCAP Policy Dialogue on the Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2019. Today's policy dialogue is a joint undertaking between the PIDS and the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, also known as UNESCO. We had a similar event last year and we would like to thank ESCAP for its continued partnership with us. But before we proceed to the presentations, may I call on PIDS President Dr. Celia Reyes for her opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone, um, to our friends from the government, representatives from the academe, um, civil society, and the private sector. Um, pleasant afternoon to you all. Um, today's policy dialogue is relevant given the recent midterm elections that we had last Monday, uh, with another set of policymakers expected to take their oaths of office. We look forward with anticipation into what's in store for our country in the coming years. In 2018, reports said that the Asian economy, which the IMF described as the main engine of growth for the global economy, would remain steady with about 5.6% growth rate. The same projection was made by the UNSCAP in their Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific for 2018, which they presented here at PIDS last year. By the way, we've been partnering with UNSCAP for many years now, and this is something that um, um, we hope will continue for, for many more years. Um, the UNSCAP report said that in order to sustain this economic performance, fiscal policies, policy should be focused on ensuring macroeconomic and financial stability. This is the current direction of the country. This afternoon, we are very pleased to have with us Mr. Vacharin Sirima Sirimanitam. Um, apologies if I did not pronounce it correctly. Um, from ESCAP to share the results of the Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2019. He will discuss the challenges as well as the risks that await us as we enter the second half of 2019. He will also talk about possible strategies to ensure that our pathway to development is in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, which is more people-centered and ecologically sustainable. And to have a um, background on the Philippines' performance in achieving the SDGs, our very own senior research fellow, Dr. Jose um, Ramon Albert, um, who we all know as TOOTS, will present a study on the Philippines' performance in terms of achieving these goals. As you all, uh, some of you might know, PIDS is leading the preparation of the Voluntary National Report on the SDGs uh, for this year. So with the information that we're about to get from, from these two presentations, we hope that this will provide valuable inputs in crafting policies and programs to help us achieve the SDG goals by 2030. So we look forward to a very fruitful discussion this afternoon. Again, uh, welcome to PIDS and um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reyes. A little bit of an information about our first speaker. He is an economic uh, uh, affairs officer in the Macroeconomic Policy and Financing for Development Division of the UNESCO. He has worked on economic monitoring and development finance and has been part of the team that produces Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific, which is ESCAP's flagship report. Prior to joining the ESCAP, he, he was with the World Bank, where he worked on macro economic surveillance for Malaysia and Thailand and country policy research such as investment climate assessments. Friends, I give you Dr. Vacharin Sirimanitham. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first, um, I would like to thank um, PIDS for kindly uh, hosting this um, policy dialogue. 
it's good uh, for me to be back in uh, Manila, Philippines again. And thank you so much for all of you for uh, coming. Uh, just a little bit of the background about the report. As, as mentioned, this um, survey is one of the uh, SCAP uh, flagship uh, publication. It has been released in uh, 1947, so it's a bit um, quite an old publication by now. Uh, as in the past year, um, the first part of the report is about um, macroeconomic outlook and some of the uh, medium-term uh, challenges. And the second part um, is about uh, the thematic uh, chapter, which um, for this year is about the, the costing the sustainable development goals. Okay. Okay, we start with some, uh, some of the main messages. The, the first one is that, uh, uh, the first part of the report, we show you that um, for, the um, for the developing Asia-Pacific region as a whole, um, the growth outlook for this um, 19 um, and 20, 20, uh, 2019 and 2020 is broadly uh, stable, and the inflation will remain relatively uh, lower. However, um, according to uh, some data that we have, we see that the steady economic growth in the region in the past uh, few decades is not really um, producing uh, this social inclusiveness or even uh, e ecological sustainability. So actually, it's now um, time for us to think uh, beyond economic growth and integrate um, the social dimension of development as well as the environmental dimension of uh, um, development. And one of the key messages of this report is that uh, we did the calculation, uh, which we show that um, for the region as a whole, uh, uh, the region needs to spend uh, additionally, on, on top of what they are already spending, about um, 1.5 trillion US dollar per year, and this boils down to about under um, one dollar uh, per person per day, or about five percent of GDP. This is not um, a small amount, um, but we argue that it's largely uh, affordable, and we also discuss some of the um, the financing strategy issue. Okay, and. In the past, um, now that we know the cost of the uh, S SDG, um, we need a shift in the mindset and also about the development model, which not solely uh, focus on the economic growth. Uh, we look at um, the, the, the well-being of the people and also the, the, the planet, uh, meaning the environment side of that. And to be able to achieve this additional investment, and it's also about the, the partnership, I will show that some country, they tend not to be able to finance this uh, SDG by themselves, and this is possible only with some uh, of the um, development partnership. So let's first go to the first part of the report on economic outlook. And we see that um, there's some uh, slowdown in the, in the region um, last year, um, from 5.7 in 2017 to 5.3 um, in 2018. And this is largely uh, from the um, from the, the, the Chinese economic slowdown and as well as increased economic uncertainty in, in, in the global economy. Nonetheless, um, the report showed that um, growth in the region remained higher than the world, which is the red line, and also higher than other developing regions of the world, uh, including Latin America and, and Africa. So going forward, uh, we project that um, economic growth this year for the region will be about 5% and going up slightly to 5.1% um, in 2020. Okay, And the slowdown this year is mainly uh, not because of the Southeast Asia where we are right now, uh, but mainly uh, about the, the Chinese economy and also uh, some country in South and Southwest um, Asia sub-region. Um, growth outlook for the Southeast Asia um, remain quite uh, stable, and indeed um, for the Philippines, we are projecting that um, this year we'll be going up to 6.5% uh, from 6.2% last year, and uh, going up a bit further to 6.6% .6 um, next year. This is partly because of the in inflation, which is we expect um, to come down. And on the inflation, um, for the region as a whole, we see that inf inflation edged up a bit um, last year um, to 3.9%, uh, from 3.2% back in 2017. 
And there are many factors which explain this, but mainly in the report we cite the, uh, the currency uh, depreciation in many of the major regional um, currencies, and also the, the pickup in the global oil prices. Nonetheless, um, we, we project that the inflation will increase slightly next year, but it remains relatively low for most countries probably not for the Philippines, but for most countries, the inflation remain below the, the official target level. Okay, uh, let's move to the, some of the short-term and medium-term risks and challenges. Uh, in the report, we um, highlighted uh, four. The first one is about uh, the trade tension. Uh, it has been ongoing at least from the beginning of last year. In another report, which is not this report, in another uh, SCAP report called Asian Development, uh, Asian Pacific uh, Trade and Investment Report, uh, we use the uh, computable general equilibrium approach um, to estimate the employment effect of this um, trade tension. Basically, it's uh, an integrated uh, model. Um, we assume that uh, whatever uh, threats that has been announced in 2018 what if they materialize in um, 2019? What would be the impact of that? And the number is that um, the region as a whole tend to lose about 2.5 um, million jobs. And if we increase, uh, if we assume that um, the trade tension also caused um, deterioration in the confidence effect, then the, the adverse um, employment effect will be even larger than these 2.7 million jobs. And the second uh, risk uh, that we highlighted is um, a rising level of the debt in, uh, in certain countries in the region, particularly uh, household debt in countries such as um, Thailand, Malaysia, and the Republic of Korea. And in China, it's more about the, uh, the corporate debt issue. And we're monitoring this um, mainly for the financial stability uh, perspective. It, it's not excessively high, but it's more about the pace that it has been increasing in the, in, in, in the past year. The third um, challenge that we highlight, um, which is more of the medium term in nature, um, the data show that uh, after the global financial crisis restarted in 2008, uh, the region as a whole has experienced a slowdown in the productivity growth, um, or TAP growth, um, total factor productivity. And there are many um, factors which uh, explain this. In the report, we highlighted two. Uh, one is uh, this rapid um, population aging. Okay, so it's about demographic change. As people become older, naturally become uh, less productive. But there's some agreement on uh, policy on how to counter that. Another is that in, in many countries, particularly in, uh, in South and Southwest Asia, such as India, you see that um, they are bypassing um, a structural transformation. Um, they shift from the agricultural society to the service-based um, society basically bypassing uh, manufacturing, uh, which is, have been an engine of growth in many countries in East Asia, in East and Southeast Asia. The thing is that um, usually the service sector is relatively um, have a lower productivity, unless it is the high productive sector such as the IT or the, the banking service sector. But those um, high productive uh, service sector usually require uh, a large pool of the high skill labor which is not necessarily the case in a developing country. The moment that you bypass this uh, manufacturing sector, then um, the economy-wide productivity level tend, tend to decrease. And finally, on the, um, on the new technology, and with the implication on the, the macroeconomic policy, this is um, still a question mark uh, for most of the, um, the angle that we are looking at. Uh, for example, um, in the context of the monetary policy, uh, this move toward a cashless uh, society, and how is that going to affect the effectiveness of monetary policy? They say that the central bank has less um, control over the demand and supply of money. How they do you control um, and manage the in inflation? Now that uh, most of the, um, not most, uh, many of the payments are online, how is that affecting uh, demand and supply of money? And also in the context of the, uh, the fiscal um, policy, on the revenue side, we see that many countries in the region, including in the, in the Philippines, they have introduced this technology in the tax collection effort. There's some um, e-payment, e-filing, which help to increase the compliance of the, the taxpayer that is on the good side. 
And uh, technology also improves the spending efficiency of the, uh, the government, now that they can track uh, who are the beneficiary, this um, online payment, and uh, opening uh, the, the new bank account that linked to the um, government support. But there's also a question about this um, artificial intelligence or this uh, job automation. Now that um, probably uh, fewer workers will be high, what are the impact of those on aggregate um, the tax revenue? These are still the uh, challenge that the region is facing. Okay, uh, if I move to it um, a bit on the medium term, we see that um, the region has maintained a really steady growth in the past uh, three or four decades, but um, it's not necessarily uh, producing uh, the social inclusiveness. If we uh, sort of uh, fixed uh, the income level of the bottom 10% income group at 100 back in 1980, which is um, about three and a half decades ago. We see that uh, today, the income level of this poorest group has been doubled. Okay. But this is much less um, compared to the medium, uh, middle 40% uh, income group and less than uh, top 10% and even much less than uh, top 1%. So basically, um, this is to show that um, today, the top 1% income group, they are about 4.5 times richer than they were three uh, and a, and a half uh, decades ago, which is much more than the, the pace that the uh, increase of the income in the, in the bottom 10%. And on about, this is about the social, uh, on the environment, um, there are many uh, statistics, but I just highlight um, two here. One is that uh, compared to other um, region in the world, we see that in between 1990 and 2015, uh, the number of the premature death uh, that, that caused by uh, air pollution in the region is the, uh, has seen the sharp test uh, in increase. And I think we are all realizing this um, firsthand experience as well. And on the, the climate risk, and out of the um, many countries in the world, um, there's one report which lists um, the country which are more vulnerable to a climate risk, um, our top 10 country in the world, five are in the Asia Pacific region, uh, including uh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, and uh, Sri Lanka. And the cause of this, uh, I mean, at least economic loss um, due to this uh, climate disaster is also really high, estimated at about 1.3 trillion US dollar. So, um, now that we uh, sort of know that uh, economic growth has not really producing a social inclusiveness and uh, ecological sustainability. What? What is? What is the next thing that we should do? Okay. Unless, uh, if you're not um, familiar with the um, the SDG, um, there are uh, 17 of them. Uh, we call SDG uh, 17 goal, and within uh, each goal, there are many um, indicators and also um, targets, so uh, um, almost um, 200 um, target indicators. So um, to make it more easier to understand, uh, we group this um, 17 goal into uh, three items, uh, what we call uh, people, planet, and uh, prosperity. Um, too easy to remember, people is about education and health, and planet is about environment, um, biodiversity, um, climate change, climate action, and prosperity is mainly about infrastructure. Okay, so I will show you um, a cost for each of these um, people, planet, and prosperity, and a bit of the, um, the detail. Sorry. Okay, and before um, going that, um, it's important to emphasize that um, at the SCAP, we are not a specialist in all of these um, costing uh, of all this environment, social, so we work in partnership with a lot of the UN agencies. Um, for example, we work with the UNICEF, um, we, we work with the FAO, um, UNESCO on education, and a lot of other UN uh, specialized agencies. In many cases, um, we did um, the costing in-house, but in other cases, we also rely on the model, existing model of this uh, UN specialized agency and we extend uh, the model in, in, in some cases. And to make it uh, simple, um, there are two broad approaches that we use, but underneath there are many um, 
deter approaches. Um, for most of the social and infrastructure sector, we use what is called intervention and unit cost. So basically, uh, for example, for the education, we sort of know that um, before today, um, un today until um, 2030, uh, the population structure, uh, how many kids uh, will be in, in which age group, okay, and uh, how many will go to uh, primary education, secondary education, and we sort of uh, assume uh, the unit cost for each student to go to this primary education, how much it costs, uh, what is the, the cost of this um, teacher, what is the cost of the uh, teaching uh, facility, and we mu multiply all this together. That is example of the intervention and unit cost. The same for uh, infrastructure. If we know that um, from today until 2030, how many kilometers of roads that we need, okay, and then how much it costs to build, maintain uh, each kilometer of, of road. And in, in if possible, we try to use this um, customized unit cost uh, for each of the country, but in case it is not possible, we use them the regional average. And the thing which is becoming more difficult to understand uh, is to um, cost the energy and environment. In most of these cases, we use the, um, the integrated model, uh, sometimes the, the general equilibrium approach, sometimes we, uh, we work with the, um, the IEA and the National Energy Association on the world um, e energy uh, model. Sometimes we simply rely on the available uh, estimate and make some uh, simple assumption. But that's the challenge of this um, study is that um, if you look at the SDG um, carefully, not all of them has the quantifiable targets. Oh, okay. For some of them, uh, you need to increase um, certain things to the nationally appropriate level. And actually, we don't know what is that nationally appropriate um, level. Um, for some, which is clearer, like um, eradicate uh, extreme poverty, so we know that it's going down to zero. But there are many which is um, becoming uh, un unclear. And also um, about the baseline scenario, simply this means we do not always know how much is the current investment in each of the SDG area. If you ask some country, how much are you investing in infrastructure? Probably they do not have a, a, a good answer. But we need to know what is being invested today to calculate what should be the additional investment tomorrow and until 2030. Uh, another thing um, is that um, the aggregation, uh, aggregation issue. Um, we know that we cost a lot of the item. Okay, how do we, and also from the different methodology, how we combine all of this together. We, we try to address this uh, issue uh, using uh, comparable uh, population projection, GDP projection, and everything is based um, to um, real prices in 2016. So let's move to the um, result. Um, simply, uh, in additional investment in uh, the people element is about um, 670 billion US dollar per year from 2016 to uh, 2030. This is on top of what is already being invested. And on the prosperity, which is mainly infrastructure, this is almost um, 200 um, billion US dollar. And third on the planet, which is about um, 590 billion US dollar. If, if you sum all of this together, it's about 1.5 trillion US dollar per year, which is about 5% of GDP on, on average. It's about $1 per person per day. So um, on the people part, um, if we were to remove the, um, the poverty and uh, ensure that uh, there's no uh, hunger and ensure um, universal access to health and good education, this is about 43 cents uh, per person per day. And for the sustainable infrastructure, this add to another 12 cents per day. And the rest is um, the clean energy for all and protection of the nature, which is um, biodiversity. But if you add up, it's actually about 92 cents per day. So it's just under uh, one um, US dollar per person per day. Whether it's small or large, I think this depends pretty much on the, the, the country and financing that you have. But generally, what we give in the, in the report is that uh, this is uh, affordable for most countries but surely um, not, not for all, which I will show later. 
Uh, now we go a bit um, into detail uh, what we mean by uh, people and what are some of the uh, components uh, on the people. And the first one is the targeted uh, cash transfer, basically um, transfer of cash to, um, to eradicate uh, extreme poverty. So we sort of estimate uh, the number of the poor uh, which remain in each country and using an international poverty line to basically make a transfer to, to reduce this poverty. And this comes out to about 22, um, 32 billion US dollar uh, per year. And on the ensuring the, um, the universal uh, social protection floor, and by this we mean a cash transfer to five group of people, um, elderly and uh, disability, uh, maternity, uh, old age, and children. Okay, so we use the national um, poverty line in, in, in this case, and this uh, is quite a, 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 a big amount. And move to uh, SDG goal two on uh, zero hunger, which is um, quite small. And in this, um, we sort of uh, estimate, for example, the cost of the vitamin that need to be taken for uh, uh, expecting a martyr. Okay, how much that would cost and also to increase the agricultural uh, productivity to produce more food, uh, basically. So we look at the ag agricultural uh, machinery and uh, uh, farming, how to reduce the, um, the, the loss during the food production process. And this adds up to another 21 uh, billion US dollar per year. And another two big items is on the health and education. So for health, um, we cost uh, on universal access um, to health. This is basically the cost of the hospital, doctor, uh, nurses, and also a health, health uh, facility and uh, information system. And finally, for the people, uh, we look at the access to uh, quality education by all. So we have this uh, preschool, uh, primary education, secondary education, and tertiary um, education. So that I mentioned earlier, we project the, uh, the number of uh, people in, uh, in each um, age group. And then we um, sort of apply uh, the unit cost, uh, about the teaching cost, but we also control for the, the quality. Uh, we assume some certain scenario about what if the smaller class size or would be the additional cost? What if we increase the um, teacher salary? What would be the additional cost in, in that sense? and move to the, um, the, the planet part. Uh, and the region has, um, at least compared to elsewhere in the world, um, this access to electricity has been relatively uh, good. So the additional cost is pretty small at uh, 10 billion US dollar per year. And in this, we assume some uh, minor detail, like a typical household, they should have access to four hours of a uh, light bulb, a refrigerator, a mobile phone charger, and for a typical household, what would be enough uh, electricity that they need per day? And um, access to uh, the clean cooking, apart from the this, um, coal um, cooking, open uh, cooking in the open air, what if uh, we have a more systematic um, cooking system uh, using gas and would be the additional. And the big item is the renewable uh, energy. Okay, what if we change the source of the energy used from the fossil fuel? to a hydro um, solar, and what would be the additional uh, amount of that, which is quite high. <coughs> and also the energy efficiency. This is from the, the, the model. We run some uh, scenario uh, on the sustainable um, development. What if um, we need to increase efficiency in the building, in the factories, uh, by replacing some of the equipment, like if um, this industry using uh, old-fashioned uh, manufacturing, or in a household, uh, really old uh, air conditioning machine, what would be the cost to replace uh, with a more modern, energy efficient air conditioning machine? And the last one, which is um, uh, a bit more difficult to understand, is um, on the cost to achieve the biodiversity. Uh, by nature, this um, biodiversity is a um, transboundary issue. Okay. So we rely on one estimate by the convention of this um, biodiversity which calculate the total cost of the whole world. Okay, there is no regional breakdown, and we simply assume that the cost for the Asia Pacific is half of this um, global number, and this is the, the amount. Finally, on the prosperity, which is uh, mainly infrastructure, and um, 
On this, uh, first we run some uh, estimation um, reg regression to be precise uh, to project the, um, the future demand by 2030. What would be the infrastructure that uh, would be needed in the, in, in the region? And we apply the, um, the, the unit cost. Um, the large part is obviously um, the, the transport, uh, the cost to provide a paved road, um, unpaved road. And we also have the element of this, um, like a maintenance cost. Okay, on top of the building a new infrastructure, what would be the maintenance cost? And also an, an element of this uh, climate resilient um, to make, for example, these uh, roads become more climate resi resilient. If the cyclone hit today, tomorrow the road should still be there, uh, how much that would cost. And ICT is about this uh, broad broadband uh, access to a mobile phone, and water is the household access to uh, the clean water. Both in a traditional sense of going not too far to get the water and also a part of this uh, systematic uh, water system. Um, of course, um, we know that uh, the, um, the overall message is that cost is relatively affordable, but clearly not for all. If you look at um, the chart on the, the left, which is about the, the least um, developed country, basically a poor country, this cost to achieve the SDG can be as high as the uh, 16%. And if they were to rely on themselves, probably um, it's not they don't have enough financing to, to finance this uh, SDG. The cost is also pretty high uh, for South and Southwest Asia and uh, lower uh, for the Southeast Asia on, on par with the regional average as about 5 to 6% and lower for uh, East and Northeast Asia and Northern Central Asia. In, in LDC, um, least developed country, and, and South Asia, this is mainly the orange part, which is the about the people. So it says education, health, which is the area that uh, they need to invest uh, significantly uh, more. And we do not officially uh, release um, the country level SDG costing, uh, mainly because um, it's not fair to, um, to compare this country level because of this data availability. Some country, uh, we may have five or six items that we cost. Some country, we may have 20 items that we cost. So it's naturally higher for the country we have uh, more, more data. At the big picture, uh, we do not even show um, the number for the, uh, the Pacific uh, SIDS, which stands for a small island developing state, uh, basically Pacific Island, because they are uh, really small and um, then the data availability become an issue. Even though we know that uh, for whatever we can cost, it's pretty high, especially for the climate, uh, climate change action. Um, so far, uh, we talk a lot about money, I mean how much it would cost, but obviously not all of the SDG goal is about money. If you think about um, gender equality, probably it's more about change in the, in the law and regulation, about uh, inheritance um, law, about um, how much um, inheritance can be given to uh, widow and, and, and daughters. And also about this video uh, inequality, which is uh, multidimensional, it's required change in the law and regulation and not I mean, require some money, but but not necessarily the focus of, of this. And obviously, um, on goal 16, on peace about the quality of the judicial uh, system. That probably is more about institutional setting rather than uh, financial investment. Okay. Now that we assume that we know the um, the total cost uh, from the country perspective, what should you do next? Um, in, in these uh, metrics, um, if you look at the horizontal line, it is uh, the finding from this report. Uh, it's about the investment need. Uh, to make it simple, we make it a small, medium, or large uh, investment need. But on the vertical line, uh, we borrow the, um, the finding from another SCAP uh, report. That report is called SDG Progress um, Report. Basically, in that report, we assess um, for each of the particular goal. Uh, to what extent uh, Asia Pacific has been doing? Is that doing good, which is what we call substantial here, or doing as we expected, or is it regressing? Okay, so we group um, the country. So the, the the first group, which is mainly about health and education, the, the social element, uh, the progress has been uh, quite good. I mean, at least compared to other goal, not not as the pace is not uh, expected, but uh, the, the pace is at least uh, faster than uh, another than goal. And the good news is also that the investment need is within reach. So this is sort of the, the low-hanging fruit. Okay, you made certain 
relatively good investment. Uh, you made certain uh, good progress and investment is relatively uh, small or this is more uh, achievable. But the bad news is um, about the, um, the grouping on the bottom right. Uh, this is mainly about environment. This is mainly about the en environment and then the progress has been uh, really small or regressing at the same time that investme investment need is really large. So you need to speed up the, the progress and also to find more financing um, strategy for this. Uh, similarly, but to a less extent on the goal 11 and goal 6 on uh, water and a sustainable city. And finally, about the goal that I mentioned is, is less about the money. So investment need is small, but the progress on this goal, uh, uh, gender inequality, peace, institutional, and uh, responsible consumption has been uh, more mixed. In a way, it's, it's important that we do not actually um, uh, put a really concrete on, on which goal, is what each country should pursue. This is a, a really a country specific uh, co context. But we're just highlighting uh, progress uh, versus the financing need. So can we afford um, this 5% of GDP for most countries? Uh, the answer is yes, but of course, uh, for countries with larger costs, it has to come with the development partnership. Uh, one of the natural um, questions is that now that we sort of know the cost, can country actually afford that? Uh, we look at the uh, variety of the indicator. Um, I'm, I'm showing just one, which is about the, the tax revenue to, to GDP ratio. And we also look at the ability of country to issue bond. Uh, we also look at the, the public debt as a share of GDP, and this is uh, part of the report. But what is this chart is showing is simply that um, if your country is above this uh, 45 degree line, it means that your tax to GDP is higher than your investment need. Mm -hmm. So you are in a relatively a good uh, position. But if you are one of the five countries below, uh, which is, for example, like uh, uh, Afghanistan, then probably um, this is um, you, you need to have a strong uh, financing strategy. Another an uh, analysis um, that we did for this report um, is called uh, efficiency analysis. Based on methodology, which is called um, DEA, um, Data Envelopment Analysis. Basically, this is a common tool that has been used to assess the uh, efficiency. The question is, um, simple um, to make in the, in the general term. Okay, the, the first task is you find a, a peer benchmarking. You look across country. Okay, let's say I give an example of education. You look across the region, what each country is spending on education and to what extent they are getting all of those uh, spending. So the good country, the best country actually, will be the country which spend the least and get the most out of that um, education. For example, you send spend relatively small, but all of your students are in the classroom and the quality of education is high. That's what we call the, the frontier um, country. And on the other end, um, if you're spending a lot, but what you are getting out of that is very little. So obviously that means that your spending is not uh, so efficient. There's um, in the report where we show some uh, input uh, efficiency and output uh, efficiency. But um, particularly about this chart, this is about the infrastructure. So it asks um, for each country, uh, the amount of money that you spend on infrastructure, how much did you get out of this? Uh, what is the kilometer of paved road, access to a mobile phone, broadband, and the result in, this is a country level, but on average, uh, we see that um, country in the region, they can spend about 50% uh, less on infrastructure to get the same output as the best performing country. Okay, so in at least in the context of the infrastructure, it's about project appraisal, project um, selection, how you implement a uh, large scale uh, infrastructure, and how you look at um, the value for money, how, m how much you can save for each of the infrastructure um, project. Um, the, the case is the same for education and health. To what extent you can improve the health um, access without um, spending uh, more money, uh, to what extent you can improve it. Okay, and finally, um, we highlight the, um, the role, uh, the potential role of the, the private um, sector. 
um, the role of this uh, private investment in the SDG uh, uh, ach achievement. If you look at the, the blue bar, it shows you the, um, this is from the Antat study anyway. Um, it shows you the, the share of the investment in each of the area that is coming from the private sector. For example, in the area of the water and sanitation, which is the second from the, the right, you see that um, only about 10% of the uh, water and sanitation in developing country is financed by the, the private investment. But in developed country, this can go as high as 50% or about half of it. So the question is, what is missing in, in the developing country? I mean, what can you do to attract, uh, to, to make uh, SDG investment more financially appealing to the, um, to the private investor? And in the report, we highlight a few such as uh, improving uh, and enabling uh, infrastructure uh, um, in investment. How do you um, explore the scope of the, uh, the private-public uh, partnership or the, the, the PPP? How can you uh, attract the, um, the engagement by the uh, institutional investor, such as the pension fund and uh, sovereign uh, wealth fund? Okay, and the end is the, um, some of the takeaway messages. So it's that uh, in a journey toward the uh, sustainable um, development, this is, it's not only about economic growth anymore, um, it, it's more about the, uh, the people and planet as well. And we show that the, the price tag, this ticket is largely affordable, although not for all. And even if um, the country, you are a country which um, financing need is very large, I mean the issue of this um, synergy and also the issue of this uh, development partnership um, can be uh, important. Um, what I would like to highlight at the end is that if you think about this, um, this costing number is the lower bound estimate in, in the sense that you miss uh, information for many country of the many sector. Once this information become available, then the total cost would be higher from that sense is the lower bound estimate. But what I did not mention is about this term called, called uh, synergy. Okay, you think about um, if you have a better access to water, it's not only, not only about the SDG goal on water, but you also help improve uh, health outcome. Okay, the cleaner water and the better health. If you invest more on uh, education, it also help the environment because you become more educated about food waste, for example. And these are what we call a uh, synergy. There are many studies about this, but um, this study did not, I mean, take into account this synergy, I mean, quantitatively, but conceptually, um, total cost would be lower if we also take into account this synergy across the SDG investment. That's the, the last message I want to say. Thank you so much. Oh, and uh, if you are interested um, in, in this website, uh, the report has been launched on the, on the uh, 4th of April. Okay, on, on this website, um, there's um, 50 pages of the online technical appendix if you are interested in, in the, of the methodology, as well as uh, other um, launch material, uh, policy brief and, and blogs and relating to this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that very informative and comprehensive presentation, Dr. Vacharin. Now to give us a picture of the country's performance in terms of achieving the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, let me introduce to you our second speaker. He is a senior research fellow here at PIDS, but prior to that, he served as Secretary General to the then National Statistical Coordination Board. He is a professional statistician who has written various topics on poverty measurement and analysis, education statistics, agricultural statistics, climate change, survey design, data mining, and statistical analysis of missing data. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert. Uh, good afternoon. As was mentioned earlier by uh, Dr. Reyes, uh, PIDS has been requested uh, by uh, you know, in the Philippines, the national, our National Economic and Development Authority is the one in charge of monitoring the SDGs. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're monitoring, it's, it's usually a, a partnership of sorts. 
uh, you know, you have the implementing agencies around, and also you have the Philippine Statistics Authority that that uh, not just collects their own data but also compiles data from other uh, government agencies. So PIDS being the government think tank, uh, they asked us to uh, uh, lead in the uh, preparation of the uh, voluntary national review report uh, for the year and. Um, Maybe m some of you may, may wonder, for the, your, you, the term VNR may be new to many of us. In the past, uh, when during the Millennium Development Goals era, we would always, countries would only come up with MDG reports. <laughs> now uh, we came up with a new term <laughs> called Voluntary National Review Report, but it's really just a, a report on the status of the SDGs. Uh, and uh, so this is what we're, we're, I'm going to be presenting on behalf of a uh, a uh, team here at PIDS. Um, so allow me firstly to give a brief background of the process behind the Voluntari Voluntary National Review. Uh, unlike in previous VNRs, usually countries were always just discussing the institutional mechanisms uh, for uh, ensuring that we will be attaining the SDGs. But with, for the first time, uh, I, uh, I think many countries are now shifting the, the writing of VNRs towards actual uh, storytelling about data. No? Uh, so this is one of the things that's kind of different. Uh, but uh, also, we are focusing on six um, of the 17 SDGs because you know, as was shown earlier, seven, talking about 17 goals is kind of complicated. <laughs> so, but because of time constraints, uh, allow me only to focus on three out of the six. Uh, the, 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 the draft is still being prepared. We're still finalizing the report. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the thrust, more or less, of the, the VNR report has been still a little bit of discussion on the process for the, the review, plus the actual examination of baseline data and trends, uh, particularly along the lines of opportunities, uh, challenges in meeting the global goals, and even measurement issues and ways forward. Um, all right, so we, we have heard already about the, the SDGs, uh, the, and what we already know from our, um, clearly from, you know, from going from the MDGs to the SDGs that it's certainly much more complicated because you have 17 goals unlike before we had uh, only 8 goals for the MDGs. Uh, so we have doubled the goals and even the targets have been expanded before we had 60 goals. So 60 targets for the MDGs. Uh, now we're working on 169 targets. And so can you imagine how many things that you'll really be examining? Um, but, and the Philippines, together with uh, uh, 192 other uh, UN member states, committed to uh, the, the Sustainable Development Agenda, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the SDGs, uh, which ex essentially extend the unfinished agenda of the MDGs and put forward a much more ambitious set of uh, and, and, and goals, targets across economic, social, environmental, and government's dimensions. And the overall guiding principle behind the SDGs is really to leave no one behind, uh, which is very much at sync with our own Philippine Development Plan and the current government's uh, zero plus 10 so socioeconomic agenda that focuses also on making sure that we come up with more equitable uh, development across the regions and even our own long-term aspirations for development uh, the, that were articulated in Ambition 2040. And uh, note that all of this were actually formulated even before the country signed up to the SDGs in 2015. Um, the 2030 agenda uh, uh, encourages UN member states to conduct regular and inclusive reviews of progress at national and subnational levels, which are country-led and country-driven. Uh, so the VNRs are usually presented at 
the high-level political forum meeting held under the auspices of the UN Economic and Social, Commission, Social Council, or ECOSOC. Uh, the VNRs are not only voluntary, but they're state-led, undertaken by both developed and developing countries, and involve multiple stakeholders. So it's not just government agencies, but you have CSOs, private sector, all working together. Uh, and the review aims to facilitate the sharing of experiences across countries, including uh, describing successes, challenges, lessons learned, with a view to accelerating the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The VNRs also seek to strengthen policies and institutions of governments and to mobilize multi-stakeholder support and partnerships for the implementation of the SDGs. Um, 42 member states, in including the Philippines, have agreed so far to present their VNRs this July 2019. The Philippines is presenting for the second time. For this year, uh, as I already mentioned, six of the global goals to be reviewed pertain to uh, uh, particularly SDG 4 on decent ed uh, education, uh, SDG 8 on decent work and, um, and economic growth, SDG 10 on reducing inequality, uh, SDG 13 on climate action, SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions, and SDG 17 on partnerships. In the case, uh, and as I sort of mentioned, unfortunately, because of time constraints, I'll be just focusing on the first three. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, uh, the monitoring as of the SDGs is largely led by our uh, National Economic and Development Authority in cooperation with the Philippine Statistics Authority um, and implementing agencies of the national government. Since 2016, our, uh, the PSA has been conducting several workshops with national government agencies and other SDG stakeholders, um, meeting even bilaterally with agencies after these workshops, and subsequently identified uh, a list of 155 national SDG indicators uh, that are supposed to be preliminary. Okay? Uh, and this, the, after the the uh, PSA board proclaimed this as the preliminary list. It, the PSA has been collect, compiling baseline data on these indicators and has been uh, disseminating these baseline data in our SDG Watch uh, platform. Last year, NEDA and uh, the PIDS identified um, and verified base the baseline data and e even the proposed targets for each of these indicators. PIDS was commissioned by UNICEF, uh, which has been assisting NEDA in the preparation of this VNR report. Aside from taking responsibility for uh, monitoring the at, uh, at attainment of the SDGs with the PSA, NEDA is also in the process of drafting uh, uh, a more detailed implementation roadmap on the SDGs, and its role to compile data on the SDG indicators, the PSA has looked into uh, um, all the 232 global SDG indicators with various government agencies and identified 100 of, 102 of these to be available. Further, uh, the 25 supplementary and 29 proxy indicators were also identified for the national SDG monitoring. Uh, last year, the national government agencies met and, and uh, adopted targets for just half of these indicators, as was mentioned. Unfortunately, when you're looking at all of these indicators and even the, the targets, the global targets and the goals, it's not very clear w how to set na the national targets. So sometimes it's, uh, we, sometimes we, the, the, the global targets are, are very easy to adopt, but sometimes you need to sort of uh, you know, look up, uh, look at the air, and try to figure out where <laughs> what <laughs> where the target will go. No, um, but nonetheless, I, and then there were also certain other indicators where it was kind of difficult to define targets, and uh, for about ten of them, and then I think government agencies also man uh, uh, um, suggested to PSA that there's a need to review 55 of these indicators. Um, now, as regards data availability of these 155 uh, indicators. Um, 126, or about 81.3%, have baseline data, and uh, 78 uh, have uh, even as much as historical data. Uh, at least two observations, uh, 
uh, when, I, when I say historical data. Data disaggregation, unfortunately, for the 126 available indicators is only available uh, for at geographic breakdowns for 38 of them. So that's uh, about a fourth or a third of the uh, 126 indicators. Then uh, also among the 126 indicators, 24 have sex disaggregated data and another have 18 gender relevant indicators. So, and, and then when you start looking at other uh, disaggregations like uh, you know, the, uh, data for disability, uh, migration status, this, we, we, there are currently no this, um, uh, granular data available. So unfortunately, uh, this becomes a very big challenge because some of the, the people that we want to dis describe are in a way missing. <laughs> we, are, we have no way of uh, describing what's going on for, for some of these uh, vulnerable populations. Um, here at the government think tank, um, we also have been uh, so far looking at, we've had a number of uh, policy research studies on, uh, on various uh, SDGs, uh, about 77 policy studies in the past three years that uh, hopefully enable government to develop proper policy actions for attaining the SDGs. Uh, allow me now to give you a snapshot of the trends, opportunities, and challenges uh, especially pertaining to equity issues in three of these global goals for the Philippines. As regards uh, SDG 4 on quality education for all, the country has, uh, been, has uh, had marked improvements uh, in uh, basic, performance, basic education performance indicators, uh, from net enrollment to completion and cohort survival rates, uh, significantly improving the past 10 years. And together with uh, this, we have seen uh, a de declining set of dropout rates. Um, thus, we are managing to find uh, last mile children and keeping them in school. There are, however, gaps in the absorptive capacity of secondary education and further, uh, the performance in basic education uh, seems to be va varying uh, considerably by region. Um, our Department of Education has been pushing uh, act has been uh, uh, provided more resources to be able to help uh, our, our uh, more kids to actually access basic education. Um, further, those who are likely to drop out are given other uh, alternative delivery modes or those who have really dropped out uh, possibilities of getting into alternative learning systems. Um, so with the support of government, efforts have been made to reduce even congestion in classrooms by hiring more teachers with current teacher-to-people ratios at around 1 is to 30. Um, other school inputs, including ICT tools such as computers, are being made available. Through a, the a continuing challenges is improving uh, internet connectivity. Uh, currently, uh, just a fourth of schools have internet access. Um, the country is also making headway in, in uh, uh, um, uh, improving access to both uh, technical, vocational, and tertiary education. Uh, our main agency uh, in, in charge of uh, TechVoc is implementing training programs in over 4,000 uh, TVET institutions, while uh, higher education is provided through uh, about 2,300 higher education institutions and satellite campuses. Greater gains in enrollment for TVET and tertiary courses uh, with the passage of our uh, Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Higher Education Act um, seem to have been initially uh, happening. Though uh, here at PIDS, we have also expressed concern that free college in state universities may actually be leading to less equity and uh, less quality. The bigger challenge we face uh, in ensuring uh, quality in education for all is really in strengthening partnerships across the trifocal agencies handling basic education, tech voc, and higher education. Uh, the shift to K-12 has provided our, uh, the country opportunities to improve the quality of education, especially as uh, skills and competencies for future jobs are vastly changing in the wake of uh, the fourth industrial revolution which we, he, we at uh, PIDS here call uh, or refer to as FIRE. You know? um, with regard to SDG 8 on um, 
decent work and economic growth, while the country has been uh, has seen robust GDP growth rate of uh, six, over 6.6% 6 .6%, no? uh, for the seventh straight year uh, last 2018. This growth has been largely fueled by the services sector, uh, which has had a growth of 6.8% in 2018. Uh, and it continues to be the largest share of the, occupying the largest share of the economy across the major industry uh, groups. As the country uh, strives to sustain economic growth through added support to the agriculture sector and the implementation of an industrial policy, uh, and also through uh, attaining free trade and other agreements that, are, that aim to bolster industry and service sectors, it will be important for us uh, to really see the changing landscape that's fueled by the emerging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. Regarding indicators of the labor market, uh, labor productivity grew in 2017 by 8.4 percent, led by the industry sector. Unemployment was registered at 5.7 5 percent in 2017, the, one of the lowest recorded since 2005. But the jobs agenda continues to be a pressing issue given the 16.1% uh, underemployment rate in the country and in that year, which suggests that a considerable proportion of those employed are looking for extra jobs or other jobs, uh, and thus suggesting further that the quality of jobs needs further improvement. A key strategy for sustaining growth of the economy is implementation of the government's inclusive um, uh, innovation industrial strategy, or called IQBS, which aims to build new industries, clusters, and agglomerations to ensure a growth of our MSMEs and uh, also to develop, uh, to strengthen human resources. Uh, further, the provision of full and productive employment and decent work uh, clearly must not just be the responsibility of our Department of Labor and Employment, but requires really a whole of government approach. Um, coupled with partnerships with the business community because government is not the main uh, sector that employs uh, uh, people. Regarding SDG 10 on uh, reducing inequality, the country has uh, seen gains in reducing uh, income inequality through though such reductions in, in inequality are also um, varying across regions. Average per capita income has been growing at, a, uh, at around 1.7% uh, from 2006 to 2015 in real terms, with the bottom 40% even growing faster at 2.2% in the same period. However, uh, regional income inequality, income disparities are stark, with the average per capita income in here in Metro Manila being thrice that of uh, the income in ARM. Right? Uh, newly released data on the first semester poverty for 2018, based on the 2018 FIES, also suggests a considerable reduction in poverty incidence uh, from uh, in three, a three-year period, but that's likely going to be a combination of the effects of income growth and reduction in inequality. However, uh, in inequality still persists with the, the, the disproportional development uh, even seen in relative poverty rates. Uh, by relative poverty, we mean here the proportion of the population with incomes below half the median income. The percentage of Filipinos with uh, incomes below half the median income uh, has decreased from 18.7% in 2006 to 15.9% in 2015. But if you're going to start breaking down the um, data sets, uh, get more disaggregated data even uh, uh, by age groups, we see that the, the youth uh, below 15 to 15 years old are still more likely to be in poverty than uh, those, um, uh, those between uh, Filipinos aged between 15 to 59 years old. Uh, so children are the most at risk uh, in, uh, to be in poverty. And this is true whether you're looking at relative poverty or even absolute poverty. Um, the government has been uh, providing a lot considerable social protection, uh, community with development employment programs geared towards inclusive development. Uh, we, we've been implementing for several years now our four Ps and uh, even a sustainable livelihood program in the Kalahi Seeds, among others. 
Um, and, um, but still, there is a, an important need for us to consider that uh, you know, we need to be able to target properly uh, government interventions um, because uh, there is always a risk that some, some people will be left behind. Uh, and as earlier mentioned, uh, uh, now with Waste Forward, um, this VNR report is going to be presented eventually in at least two global venues this coming July. Um, since last year, our government agencies have been uh, not busy not only looking at validating the baseline data that have been compiled by the PSA, uh, but also come, come up with targets, national targets, and PIDS has, uh, PIDS here, we have uh, uh, started drafting this report is, is since last year, uh, so and even presenting this in as many as uh, so far 11, and this is the 12th workshop so far where we presented it, uh, the draft report, uh, soliciting comments from various stakeholders, representing government, uh, development partners, the private sector, and CSOs. And in fact, we've also been presenting the report in specific forums with children, labor groups, and uh, some other CSOs. Um, with, with regard to the monitoring of the SDGs, the, um, there's the, this whole process of VNRs uh, will really be a, a continuing review. Uh, right now, uh, the PSA is uh, engaged in, in looking at what on the 155 indicators thus far, uh, examining not just the actual availability of the indicators, but getting more into the relevance uh, of what was initially defined as the, the indicators with the advice of experts, hopefully, the, though this review will not be completed until the VNR report has been finalized. Um, we, have, we here at PIDS have been collecting a number of comments on the indicators and, been, uh, and we have forwarded uh, many of these uh, uh, suggestions to the PSA uh, so that they could uh, improve uh, the list of indicators uh, over the next few years. And as, as I mentioned, as, uh, NEDA is uh, also currently working on more intensively and uh, having a more detailed roadmap to achieve our, our 2030 targets um, and also assisting the PSA in its review of the SDG indicators. Now clearly, uh, the, as already mentioned, the, the fulfillment of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs uh, can only be accomplished with the unrelenting, the full and unrelenting support of all stakeholders and government agencies. Um, and we will be needing more investments uh, and also more and better data because if without, without disaggregated data, we won't be able to see very clearly where to put our, uh, uh, our, our specific interventions. So g government will really need to come up with much more relevant public policies and programs that will help us uh, achieve this ultimate vision of a sustainable and inclusive development in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much for that enlightening presentation, Dr. Albert. Now we are ready for the open forum. May I, uh, just a gentle reminder to our audience, please state your name and your affiliation before asking the question. And we will be taking two questions at a time to give chance to everyone. Now we would like to ask the, the first set of questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. You. Yes. I will lend you my mic, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you for the excellent presentations of our experts from the UN and from the, our PEDS. Now, uh, I'm Dan Agustin uh, Masagana, a subsidiary, agricultural subsidiary 
of the Land Bank of the Philippines, and I'm also not from ARM, but we call it now BARM, or the Bang Samoro uh, region in Muslim Mindanao. And uh, thank you, Dr. Albert, for your focus on quality education, particularly in the uh, touching also on agri sector. Um, on policy recommendation, I have here a uh, good uh, report of bids on the on the agribusiness uh, roadmap in the Philippines. Uh, a good report, and uh, on agri uh, agri uh, development roadmap. Um, perhaps as a recommendation, uh, I recommend uh, that uh, we also. Uh, uh, revisit the curriculum in agri, agri uh, agricultural education because uh, if you study for example in the in, agri in our agricultural school it's so specialized that our people are uh, specializing on seed on uh, insects but uh, because of your recommendation that we should not take a, a total value chain in agribusiness I think we should uh, have a curriculum on the, a broader uh, perspective by, by our agriculturists that they study not only agricultural production but up to agribusiness. And second, uh, our exper expert on the United Nations stats on water. Water is important not only for our uh, taking a bath or for our health, but also in agriculture. How about putting up us in the Philippines a department on water so we can integrate all of this irrigation. I have attended an irrigation uh, forum here. Our irrigation system is to badly needs uh, development and uh, water is also needed in our agriculture. And uh, for our UN expert, thank you for your presentation, sir. And uh, last year in the APEC summit, our APEC countries did not arrive on an agreement. We do hope that you furnish your, uh, a report to our uh, ministers so that uh, this time, uh, should our ministers uh, uh, meet in a summit again, they can have an agreement. And uh, may I seek clarification on your statement, earlier statement, that there was a slowdown in growth last year because of the, due to China. Uh, was the because of the uh, uh, trade war with the U.S. and uh, you mentioned the uh, partnership uh, on the private partnership, public uh, on the water, 50% uh, in developed countries whereby they spent uh, uh, public uh, or the government spent 50% of their budget on, the, uh, on water, whereas in the developing countries only 10%. Now, uh, also uh, on infrastructure, do you think that uh, uh, the recent uh, summit in China, particularly the uh, Belt Road Initiative, would improve further investments in the Asia-Pacific region as a driver? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Agustin. May we hear from Dr. Uh, Albert first, then uh, to be followed by Dr. Vacherin. Uh, well, I think the reviewing curriculums is certainly part of what's necessary to be able to ensure uh, that we are preparing our human resources properly for the changing labor m market uh, conditions. But that's just part of the many things that we need to do. I mean, even right now, I, I don't need to go to higher education, even going, looking at basic education alone, we know that many of our teachers, regardless of whatever curriculum you, or, 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 or things that you need to tell them, that they should be teaching, they're kind of overburdened with admin, with non-teaching responsibilities. And, and I think those are the things that we need to sort of look out for, that, uh, uh, that there should be ways for us to review our current ways of doing things. And 
and I sort of suggested earlier that uh, the, the bigger challenge is that uh, right now there are no institutional mechanisms that enable our trifocalized agencies to, to have a, a common agenda of sorts. Uh, their planning processes seem to be very, in a way, uh, independent of each other. Uh, so it's uh, going to be important to really strengthen partnerships, institutional partnerships. And even within the, the, the institutions themselves, there's a need to, to, for people to, to, to be able to look through the, 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 the huge data that they are collecting from various administrative sources to be able to try to ask so what are what's happening? Because there's there's this risk that that um, that government agencies are continue to becoming data rich but information poor. You know, so uh, this is one of the things that uh, that we need to be more much more careful about. That there's uh, there's uh, you know that that there should be really some integration of data and and policy uh, and 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 certainly. Certain actions can be undertaken, as you sort of suggested, about um, improving uh, course curriculums in higher education, but it's much more than that. Uh, so we, we need uh, a, a more detailed um, uh, set of integrated approaches to be able to ensure that uh, we're properly uh, going to uh, train our human resources for the jobs of the future. Um, when you talk with the business sector, er, er, earlier um, I was saying also that with this fourth industrial revolution, uh, typically the fourth in the, 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 our, our business sector would always say that uh, we need also people to have soft, soft skills rather than just the hard skills. But uh, as a measurement person, I also wonder how do you, what exactly the soft skills mean, <laughs> and 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 how do you measure them? How do you know that you are you're improving the soft skills of people? So, but those are the things that we need to to sort of put in place, um, uh, because the reality is education is not just you know what is uh, uh, you know technical skills, but but really much more than that too. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Albert. For Dr. Vachalin, there are two issues or questions raised. Okay. All right. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the, um, the, the, the questions that you have. Um, I think there are mainly uh, two issues. Uh, first is about China, mm -hmm. and um, second is about the, uh, the, the BI, the, um, yeah, the Bell and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. Okay. On um, China, this is. Uh, one of the uh, topic that we discussed in the report on at, at length actually uh, about the um, the trade tension okay so to answer your question yes um, it's a bit about the um, the China um, slowdown uh, as a result of the trade tension but also broadly it's about the China's own uh, structural uh, transformation you know that um, in recent years China has um, transformed from the like sort of uh, shipping the, the engine of growth uh, from investment to consumption, from manufacturing to service um, sector. Okay, this is part of the long, lo long term plan uh, to make it more, um, to make growth uh, more friendly to the e environment and, and many other factors. So, um, on one hand, it's, it's about the medium term trend, okay, and policy induced, I mean, in, in intentionally, it's not by uh, crisis and all that. And uh, on your trade um, tension, uh, the report um, note that um, the direct impact will be especially on uh, the Chinese economy. But it's not only about that because the indirect um, impact is also quite uh, sizable. For example, um, the Philippines uh, may export a lot of the uh, raw material, this elect electrical electronics um, product to, to China for final assembly, which is um, eventually export to um, the United States of America. So in that sense, um, also commodity uh, exporter to China, such as uh, Mongolia or Australia, they are also indirectly uh, affected by this uh, trade tension. Um, there's one chart in the report which um, measure this uh, exposure of uh, each country to this uh, trade tension. And Philippines is not, is not that particularly uh, large. 
and it's determined by the what, what, what are you exporting to China and whether that product is assembled in China and sent to the US um, eventually or not. Okay, that's the first part. And second, on the Belt and Road Initiative, and for many who are not probably familiar with that, it's the initiative by uh, the Chinese um, uh, country on the, um, the, the medium term, uh, basically uh, what we formally refer to as a Silk Road. Okay, so basically a way toward um, Europe, okay, by land and, and by sea, okay. So SCAP actually did a study last year uh, using some uh, methodology, um, the computable general equilibrium. Um, the key finding is that in principle, this uh, BRI um, should support the output growth and trade in the region, especially in the country along the corridor. There are, there are five or six um, corridors. So we estimate the output impact corridor by, uh, by corridor. And but more recently, um, there's um, some concern about the, um, like the de for example, debt sustainability, um, because this um, investment from China, uh, oftentimes it comes with the, the lending as well. So we are not in the position to um, comment on a country specific, but it's really up to the country for the project selection and the project management and to keep in mind of this uh, prudent um, macro management. So uh, public debt sustainability um, can become an issue, but if the paid off from the investment, for example, Chinese investment in seaport, generate more uh, income for the country, then it's about the medium term uh, investment like you, you have to trade off between cost and uh, the, 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 the benefit. But in principle, as a UN agency, this uh, regional cooperation is something that we support. Thank you so much, Dr. Vachaid. Another set of questions, please, from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, uh, Stella from the College of Public Health in UP Manila. So I'm I am actually working for uh, the go for the health sector. So. Dr. Bashan uh, showed earlier a nice slide about on how much the public sector will be able to contribute in terms of uh, development. So although in the Philippines there are three laws um, that we adhere to in terms of PVP and more importantly those laws are geared most of the time into infrastructure development. So in terms of the SEA countries, um, you mentioned also about benchmarking how do we, or which country, in terms of health, uh, would be would you recommend so that we can benchmark our project because I'm working uh, as well for a project on health. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Vacherin. Yes, just one question. Um, thank you. First thing, I'm not uh, the health expert, but I've tried to answer uh, to the extent possible. And I hope I mentioned that um, actually in the on, on the website, there's the, um, um, on what we call online technical appendix, which is about 50 uh, pages, okay, which explains some of the methodology, including the uh, this efficiency analysis. Okay, so in, in that we provide some uh, country level um, finding as well. So we sort of uh, highlight uh, what, which country we consider as the best practice country. But it's important also, very important actually, um, to note that um, the approach that we adopt have certain uh, limitation. Uh, it's called data and envelopment analysis. So for example, um, uh, let's say that uh, in, in some area, um, Cambodia, I'm not sure if it's the health or education. Uh, in Cambodia and in Malaysia, these two are considered quite um, good in terms of this um, social spending. But you, on the actual raw data, you have to see that actually uh, Cambodia is spending uh, much less. I mean, it's considered good because for the little that they are spending, the health or the educational outcome is good. But we are not saying that they should not spend more and we, we are not saying that the uh, Malaysia should uh, spend less. It's all about, because it is the peer benchmarking, right? it's all about a relative term. And another caution is that um, this is not quite account for the, the, the quality, okay? 
because in the sense that the, this approach, uh, if you sort of bias again uh, the developed country, uh, in the sense that if you imagine uh, access to healthcare, the maximum you can do is 100. Okay, every uh, citizen in the country have access to a healthcare system. So um, you cannot go higher than 100, right? No matter how much uh, you invest more. In, in developed countries such as uh, Australia, New Zealand, probably they invest a lot more uh, because of the, they in improve in the quality of this healthcare, okay, which is something that uh, this approach cannot be, um, can, cannot, cannot take that in, in, into account. So in a way, um, the result from the developed country will be at a disadvantage. And if you were to discuss a bit more uh, uh, technical uh, detail, um, unlike uh, manufacturing production, um, you sort of know um, what is the input, what will be the output when you produce something, right? Uh, it's not the case for uh, social spending, okay? How much you invest on health, not necessarily uh, they have a fixed uh, production that give you what would be the outcome on, on that health. It depends pretty much on the country uh, specific. So in that sense, measurement of the input and output can be uh, difficult. For example, um, if you are a, a, a Pacific island, you have many hundred um, isolated islands, so naturally um, your fixed cost of providing healthcare will be really high. Okay. So if you are spending high, but your outcome is not uh, that good, you may be considered not really uh, efficient, but actually it's, it's less about that. It's about you having hundreds of isolated islands how do you ensure that uh, this island of 50 people get enough uh, educated uh, um, health service, uh, for example. Yeah. But I invite you to have a look at um, the online technical appendix. It, it has a two-page discussion on, wh on why this approach should be interpreted with caution, but also, more importantly, it gives you a country level so you can have a country to compare. Thank you so much, Dr. Vachalin. Questions, please? Yes, sir. Ramon Clarete from UP. Uh, <coughs> uh, question for uh, Mr. Vacharin. Uh, I just want to be clarified about the methodology in the costing. Okay, say uh, there's a, of course you, you have you you did mention about some of the goals that are not uh, readily quantifiable, but for some of these that are quantifiable, say for example goal number one, which is uh, zero poverty. And uh, well, you have some costing. Eventually, uh, if you sum it up all, we need five percent of GDP to attain this goal for Asian Pacific. Uh, and focus now, for example, in this goal. How did you come up with the cost? Is it okay if, if so much? You say in a country, twenty percent of the population is below poverty. Are we saying uh, we need X number of dollars? to escape from poverty or and and we we summed it up so i need to be clarified there and because the question is uh, uh, what's the how about the sustainability of it so as far as i know for example a sustainable uh, uh, attainment of that goal would would really require growth as well as uh, a more better distribution of assets so the other one I ask is about maybe this is not really an S cup, but the goal of renew uh, <coughs> clean energy that may not be so uh, well. It, I don't know exactly the indicator there, but uh, it could be that uh, if you focus that all energy will be hundred percent coming from renewable, uh, there is still the problem of that particular technology in the sense of. Uh, is the intermittency problem of renewables already solved that so that they can become baseline uh, sources of energy? So uh, would the technology of battery catch up in the next horizon so that uh, this kind of problems about intermittency will will be uh, will be solved and we are basically. Uh, uh, making use of the renewables as a baseline sources of energy. Thank you, Dr. Clarete. Dr. Vacharin, your thoughts on the questions, please. 
Um, thank you for the, um, the, the, the two questions. On, um, on costing the goal one, uh, which is there are no uh, property, uh, I, I agree with you. There, um, I mean, first about actually what we did and what we think. Okay, so what we did, uh, as simple as uh, for each country, how many poor people are in, in the country. Okay, and we adopt this the international um, poverty line, but this is of course adjust to the, uh, the, the the national. Um, basically, to give money to um, to those people. Okay, that is really simple. So hopefully they meet the poverty line and they they become uh, non non poor. Okay, yeah. But um, a more important this is what we did. But the more important thing is um. Uh, actually, there's some uh, study on the, the on the synergy across the, the SDG investment, and one of the clear um, so it it simply look at the correlation across the SDG investment. One of the clear really clear finding is that uh, this goal one on poverty, it has the greatest um, synergy with other uh, investment in SDG. So basically, it means that whatever you invest in education, health, environment, it coming to help the uh, the, the poverty. That part we did not cost um, explicitly, but conceptually, yes. That and that is the more long-term solution to the, uh, the, the the poverty that you also um, highlighted. And on the um, on the renewable uh, energy, yes, um, we are not. I mean, this is a costing exercise. It's more like an accounting in in a way. Uh, we we look at the um, it is the, um, the the world energy model. So we look at the what what are the primary source of energy right now? Uh, fossil fuel, and what if we were to replace this by um, the hydropower, um, the wind, um, solar cell, okay. In, in that sense, it's uh, the cost that we, we did. Whether it's actually feasible that in the next 15 years, this will completely replace the, the fossil fuel, um, we do not have an answer to that, but definitely not for all country. But we hope that um, this is more like um, okay, sort of uh, an NM. Okay, if you were to replace um, foreign uh, current uh, fossil fuel used with this uh, renewable, that would be the amount that you need. But whether you can achieve that or not is, is yeah. And another part is on this um, maybe for this goal and other goal on this the role of the technology. Okay, because we do not know actually ten years from now what will be the technology. What we cost is um, actually today. For example, um, in, in one of the uh, items that we cost uh, is about the, um, the, the mobile phone. Okay, we still, our assumption is still use the, the 3G um, technology uh, because that allow us to have uh, data for many country. But actually now it's uh, 4G, 5G, so we, sh we did not account for that um, uh, the, the quality. I guess it's the same for the um, energy um, technology going forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Vachelin. Dr. Albert, would you like to add something? Okay. So we proceed to the next set of questions. Questions from the audience, please. Yes, Dr. Orbeta. Uh, Dr. Orbeta, PIDS. I'd just like to uh, clarify uh, the infrastructure investment that, you that the report is saying is about 196 billion for transport ICT and about 434 billion for goal 7. Uh, so that's about 630 billion and I think ADB just released uh, last year the infrastructure needs of Asia Pacific and it's 1.7 trillion annually which is just the 0.7 the report is just estimating uh, the 0.7 part but not. So I, I uh, what's the uh, source of the s this big difference uh, uh, in the estimates. Okay. Dr. Vachalin, your response, please. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, yes, we are aware that the report is, uh, is the ADB, uh, for your background, is the ADB report back in uh, 2017, I think, okay, uh, which did the costing for the infrastructure in a developing uh, Asia-Pacific country. And the headline number, which has been uh, widely cited, is, is the number that you mentioned, is 1.7 trillion dollar per year. Okay. And so we actually um, compare um, carefully our study with, with that study because it is mostly uh, cited. 
one important point to mention is that that uh, 1.2 trillion US dollar is the um, total investment need. Okay, and our study on the number that we cited is the uh, additional investment need. That's why our number is much uh, smaller. Okay, because um, but if you look at the ADB study, the the part only for the additional investment then it's become more comparable to our uh, SCAP uh, study. The second point is that um, because that ADB study is um, wholly about infrastructure, uh, so power um, element is also part of the, the, the costing. But in this uh, SCAP study, we separate um, the energy part into the, the planet part, the so called uh, energy efficiency, the climate action. So uh, that make our number lower Okay, but if we were to include the energy in our possibility part, the number would be um, also comparable. And the third point is that in the online technical appendixes, uh, we highlight um, quite a few uh, issues. I mean, basically the difference in, in the assumption that we, that we did. Okay, and how is that compared to the ADB study, for example? Um, for some of the uh, infrastructure um, component, we apply um, different uh, unit costs across country. Probably by that time the data was not uh, available, so it will be used uh, the same unit cost for all country. And many of these tiny, um, uh, small uh, assumption and, 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 and data set used. But basically, the bottom line is that if you compare the same thing, the number become uh, co comparable. If you include the energy, if you focus only on additional investment rather than total investment need. Thank you, Dr. Vachelin. Questions, please. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the lady Muna, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Lizen from the Development Academy of the Philippines. First, my question is for Mr. Vat. Uh, you mentioned in your first few slides that we need to uh, to have a mind mindset shifting our minds mindset uh, behaviors and paradigms I'd like to um, take some notes from you on that and then for Dr. Albert um, how do we further localize the implementation of SDGs considering that we have a new set of uh, local and national officials for the Senate for the senators of course uh, what um, sound uh, legislative agenda would you like to propose in order to really uh, implement and operationalize SDGs? Thank you. So for this, let us start with uh, Dr. Albert. Well, uh, it's very clear that the SDGs are far more complicated, uh, you know, uh, to, but to, to the extent that, that um, you know, we're, we know that our, we do have our Philippine Development Plan and all the LGUs, they have a host of plans that they, they come up with every year from investment plans to what have you. But I, my sense sometimes is, are, is, is, there, is there, are all of these plans at the local level and national level, are they at sync? Uh, and, and to what extent do, do we even think about you know, intersections uh, uh, even across goals. If you, if you make this investment here, uh, you know, in health, in nutrition, for instance, I mean, I, very specifically, I, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a bit more concerned that for a number of years, we've always been recognizing that, that although this isn't part of the, <laughs> the VNR itself, but the, the goal on nutrition, uh, on, on, on on reducing hunger, we know that many of our kids are, have been stunted, but up to now, there, there still is very little action, uh, not just by national government, but even local governments themselves. Uh, there, are, there are funds available, you know, even in terms of climate action, but they are, they're sitting. <laughs> they're not properly invested. And even if, let's say, we decide because there's a little bit more fiscal space, um, question is, are we properly spending? Uh, are we just, or are we just spending for the for the sake of spending? <laughs> uh, these are the things that we need to be much more careful about, um, because I I think the currently uh, on one hand we're 
where uh, we're, we're seeing now a, a, a fresh new wave of, of new local leaders who seem to be millennials also. Uh, they, and and they, they may have their own ideas, but I think the conversations have to be much more grounded uh, because sometimes we may be suggesting policies and, in, and interventions that may not be needed. Um, there are clearly some areas, and even now we we do, we have we have we have uh, we have a, a region for the longest time arm that has been very um, far away from from much of much of the entire country, and and we have we recognize that now that we have uh, changed from arm to barm, <laughs> uh, they have uh, a new setup. But I also wonder to what extent national will be, national government agencies will be assisting them because there's this risk that the independence that they may have may, you know, if you're, you're independent, but at the same time now you can be spending whatever you want to spend, but they may not be spending properly. Uh, and they may not have the capacity to also know where to spend, you know, <laughs> to, they may be having a lot of uh, projects not just from national government, but even development partners. And I don't know to what extent there we're, we're sort of reaching out to, to, to regions that are far behind us. Uh, so these are the things that, that I hope the local governments who are far ahead <laughs> will start recognizing that they are, you know, you, you may be heading towards heaven, but, but what, uh, what about the rest who are being left behind? Because the SDGs are not are principally about ensuring that we don't leave anyone behind, and by leaving no one behind, we also mean regions that might be left behind, local governments that may be left behind. You know, so what are the institutional mechanisms that will enable a first-class municipality to help a sister sixth-class municipality? You know, um, these are the things that are not there. The incentive structures are not there to even work on um, things like climate risks. You know. uh, the climate is changing dramatically, uh, and yet I, I don't know to what extent we're, we're sort of really pushing partnerships. Uh, we may be doing too much, and, and I don't know whether what we're doing is really going to have that much impact. Uh, so we need to also s ensure that as we start formulating actions, we we have uh, a lot of more, a lot more m um, monitoring and evaluation systems in place that will enable not just local governments but national government agencies as well to to um, to f to refocus in case they may make mistakes because everybody makes mistakes in the programs. So uh, right. We, we keep having all of these MNE systems in supposedly in place when you have projects, but I also don't know to what extent after you have MNE indicators there saying this is what's happening, what what's the next what what comes after? <laughs> um, so the civ civil society will need to be stronger to have, be having a stronger voice to ensure that we need to account let institutions be accountable. And uh, I think uh, those are the things that we need to slowly prepare institutions to become stronger to, to act and act fast. Thank you so much, Dr. Albert. Dr. Vacharin, your thoughts on shifting of mindset in relation to SDGs? Hi. Um, thank you for the question. Um, this is actually one of the, the main message of the, the report. So um, let me give you a bit of the uh, uh, example. Um, we we all know that um, Asia Pacific in the past in the past few decades has been I mean economic growth has been driven ma mainly by uh, industrialization. Okay, we explore a lot of these um, low wage um, worker who move from the rural to uh, urban area, and this is how countries uh, um, the um, the East Asian tigers like uh, Korea, um, Thailand, Taiwan has been growing very 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 fast in the past, and but um, people less question about whether this the heavy industrialization and what is that the impact on the environment okay 
which is understandable. I mean, by, by that time, I mean, the, the well is probably a, like a number one priority and people believe in, in, in that. But now increasingly, um, we are trying to promote the issue of uh, not like becoming rich and then sort out the, um, the I income distribution later. Uh, but probably we do this uh, at, at, at the same time. Another example is um, that we also highlight in the report is uh, the, is the issue of the uh, fiscal spending. If you look as a whole, um, Asia Pacific is quite um, have a, a strong uh, fiscal uh, discipline in a way that uh, we maintain a low um, fiscal deficit and the level of public debt is considered uh, manageable. Okay. From the macroeconomic uh, perspective, this is really good. Okay. But uh, the big question that we um, um, encourage people to think is um, actually um, where, where are you spending? Okay, if this um, country maintain a really strict uh, fiscal discipline, uh, I mean you are well regarded for being a really good finance ministry, but actually uh, what are the other parts in the society uh, that are still many poor? What is the environmental uh, condition? Okay, if the social outcome and environmental outcome are still really poor, but you maintain a really strict uh, financial uh, um, or fiscal uh, discipline, probably that's a question mark whether that, that could be changed. And but but the bigger question is also about um, the measurement of this economic activity, and we rely a lot on the, the GDP. And what are the al alternative way of uh, measuring? There's an increasing uh, initiative uh, on the uh, uh, on the accounting part, uh, which measure GDP that take into account the environmental uh, uh, damage. But that is still uh, the, the ongoing. So actually, the most commonly used and really easy to uh, to cite is uh, still a GDP growth in this country, and this is that is what we still compare when we talk about uh, the macro performance. In the report, in uh, chapter one, we we highlight one uh, 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 easy example: is that um, driving a car actually helps to increase the GDP because you you buy a car, you need to fuel uh, the car, but actually walking. It's not quite contributing to the, uh, the the GDP. That's the change of the mindset. GDP is higher with driving, but uh, if we walk, and probably not GDP is not higher, but environmentally is is better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vachelin. Um, may we hear a follow-up question from Mr. Abustin? Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, it's good that uh, you touch again on water. I asked a question, but uh, it was answered, and you ended your talk on water. Now, uh, can you give us a uh, glimpse on how the de developed countries manage their water? And uh, to Dr. Albert, do you agree that we should now centralize all of these water agencies in the Philippines so that uh, there's a focus on water in the Philippines? And I agree with you that in BARM, uh, we need a development plan, and uh, I, may I appeal to our president, uh, Dr. Celia <laughs> Reyes, to make a study also on the barn, because when I attended the lecture of uh, uh, Secretary Pernia in UP Economics, the poverty incidence as raised by Dr. Claretti in uh, Maguindanao, in our province, is almost 50 percent. Grave. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we start with Dr. Albert. Um, it's these things about creating new departments. It's um, there are always uh, advantages and disadvantages <laughs> in 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 trying to to come up with solutions because sometimes the solutions the solu what you might think of as the solution to one problem may carry the seed of the next problem. You know. <laughs> So I I I I would uh, caution always people against uh, immediately thinking that it's just a matter of creating new organizations that will be because even the existing organizations now uh, I think there might be scope for them to to really continue on with the uh, only thing is again going back to the whole idea that I was mentioning that. Question is: Are we generally, you know, putting our resources correctly on the right places? I think that's the very thing that we will need to first ask ourselves. Uh, what should we be prioritizing, given the fact that 
economics will all I'm not an economist I'm a statistician by profession and I but the little that I know that that I know from uh, from economics and and working with the with my colleagues here is that uh, you know, we know that even if we do have physical space, resources are not infinite. <laughs> so we do need to make some choices, and the choices sometimes are hard choices. We need to make prioritization. Uh, so while we keep saying everything is important, in reality, we need we need to focus. Um, definitely, I'm not a, a water specialist. And um, what I can say about water is actually only in the in the report. Okay, I think that in the context that you mentioned is more about the. Um, I mean, if not about water, if uh, private investment in the infrastructure, okay, is that the data show that um, in a developing country, really few uh, private investors are interested in, in investment in the sustainable development. Okay, and the question is, is why? Probably um, it's not financially uh, appealing, but why in developing, why in developed country, the investment by private investor is much um, higher? Okay, what, what has to do with the uh, country risk? Okay, what has to do with the, um, the certainty about um, having a contract with the, uh, the, the government? Okay, that is political risk. And also the issue of this uh, capital market uh, development. If you were investor, how much do you mobilize fund um, dom domestically? Okay, and we tackle more of those um, broader issue. Although I hope I know more about uh, water, but not quite. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vacherin. For for our last question, yes, ma'am, Mrs. Stella, please. All due respect to Dr. Uh, Albert, um, I'd like to make a feedback on your comment about institutional mechanisms in the country. I think we have a very good institutional mechanisms, but the MNE, though, <laughs> is really vacillating. Um, I think also that I'm rooting actually from the grassroots level because I've seen from the national level to the region to the LGUs up to the to the communities. So I think it's always about program or implementation issues, right? So um, is there a move to review the local government code? I'm not pro-federalism, but it's always uh, drilling down to that area. So I think probably uh, it could be <laughs> something that we move to, we look forward to. Dr. Albert, you. would you like to comment on well, that? Uh, when I said uh, there are I never said that there are no institutional mechanisms, but I'm just saying that are we sure that they're they're working? Because if indeed, I, I see, you know, we always coordinate, but does coordinate translate into effective development actions? You know, the fact that we know that their implementation deficits clearly suggest there's something wrong. <laughs> so even if the mechanisms are there, they maybe have their in certain areas, but not all even. I was already mentioning particularly for, for the trifocalized agencies at, in educa the education sector. Uh, it's, I, I don't think they really have planning and finance, you know, planning activities together. <laughs> they, they do planning independently. That's what I mean by, by the lack of mechanisms in certain se sectors. But you're right that in some there might be, because coordination is strong, but it's like, uh, unfortunately, right now, I, I'm not too sure whether we're, we're, we're documenting the good practices properly and even the bad practices. <laughs> because we, we tend to just talk about the bad practices, but the, in the, at the end of the day, when you have a new local chief executive say who says, what am I going to do? I, I heard just recently uh, a senator-elect saying, what should I do? <laughs> So if you don't know, you know, but that alone is uh, is already suggesting there's something wrong, isn't it? Uh, if if they they run and then uh, okay, let's say they okay they won now, but how do we influence them to to do to do things to help us really get out of all of these implementation deficits? Uh, we've always been saying all along that we have all the nice plans, but at the end of the day, the plans don't always get into actions uh, and and that to me is worrisome because 
uh, that suggests there's there's something wrong somewhere, and we're and and for the longest time we've always been saying the same thing. But how come na, there's there's no traction in in having? We've had a few local government areas in the past, but it seems to be always personality oriented. Uh, and you remove that person in charge, things fall apart. We've seen that in national government, we've seen that in local governments, seen that in government agencies. So why is it that institutions are not strong enough? You know? Yeah. Well, supposedly there should have been for the longest time, di ba? I mean, uh, uh, the only thing is, I think, legislatively, uh, there has been in the past someone who didn't want a, a review, but now there should be. I mean, I, I do support that that local governments should be strengthened. The only question is, is, is federalism the answer? Maybe because the question may be the wrong question in the first place. You know? <laughs> but anyways, that's another thing altogether. But... Uh, but I, my, my, my sense is that, you know, the conversations really need to continue uh, and, and we need to make sure that the decision makers, the final ultimate decision makers are listening. <laughs> okay, so uh, Mr. Vacherin, would you like to say something before we close? Um, thank you so much for uh, all of you uh, who, who come today, especially uh, uh, PADS for kindly hosting this uh, policy dialogue. Uh, the only last thing to say is that I have been doing this um, policy dialogue in in many uh, country for for many years, and definitely this is one of the most uh, lively and uh, stimulating. So thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so so this concludes our activity today, and we would like to. Thank our speakers for their insights and the audience for their active participation. But before we let go of our participants, may we request you to please fill up the evaluation sheets given to you earlier and give it to the Secretariat. Thank you very much and see you in our future activities. <laughs>